Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Really interesting session this morning, going to be focused on um, the German market, um, particularly the real estate market, and we'll be looking at that as well as some of the sort of key macro political trends that are happening there, um, and what that means in general for, for real estate markets going forward in Germany, as well as picking up the perspective as well um, from, from Europe in terms of how um, Germany fits within that European perspective and the international capital flows. Um, so really interesting session lots to get through this morning um for those who don't know me my name's richard betts i'm the uh, the publisher at, uh, at real asset media and we run around 80 events of these uh, any of these events a year including coming up a, a full program at mipim and later on in the year um, a full program at expo real um Let's let's just start um, with with a brief presentation from uh, Inga Schwartz. So Inga's just going to, I suppose, just share some of the kind of a, a brief kind of view on some of the the key points, um, and then we'll use that as a springboard for the discussion. Um, so over to you, Inga. Yeah, welcome everybody. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here and have the privilege to give you a rough introduction to the German investment market. It'll be fairly macro um, because I think we have such a great panel um, and so many topics that we need to discuss that um, I'll just jump into it right now. Um, first slide, please. So what I'll do is give you an introduction on the German investment market, some very brief um, comments on the underlying occupier markets and then touch the topics 2022 that we as BNP Paribas think will drive the market. Um, that's actually my most favorite slide. Um, it puts Germany into perspective, the European perspective, and it gives you a good idea of the interest in markets dynamics that we see. Germany came in second place in 2021 in terms of investment volume. But you can see here, we saw a dip in 2020 for sure, but we've always kept performing above average. We are plus 7% up year on year to 64 billion. UK uh, came back into pole position, but still performing below average, but saw a um, considerable hike by 21% year on year. But you can also see if you move your eyes a little to the, towards the middle, that Berlin is um, outperforming, and many of the German countries are outperforming entire countries. Um, unfortunately, I cannot see that now, but um, I know it's been um, Poland and um, Ireland, and uh, Cologne was even stronger than Milan. So that's uh, quite a big story. Um, what you can also see is that the German capital still has a gap to close. Oh, that's beautiful. I can see that now. In terms of um, being a runner up to central London and central Paris, um, they are still playing in a different league. So next slide, please. Um, where's the money going? Um, the German ACE cities attracted 68% of capital invested in the past year. Berlin is uh, clearly in the lead with a very strong volume of more than 11 billion euros. Um, the German capital sets itself apart recently from Munich and Berlin, clearly above average. It was the second best result ever recorded in Berlin. Same holds true for Munich. Munich with a very strong year, seeing a couple of very big office uh, deals, uh, almost unusual. Then Frankfurt, below average, but um, um, still a good result with almost 7 billion. The top performer of the year is Cologne with a stunning result. Everybody likes and loves Cologne lately. And uh, if you think, oh, interest in the second largest German city, Hamburg, is very limited. No, nope. lack of product is what was driving the market last year in my hometown, which you can see in my back. Um, single deals have been dominating the market with a market share of 75%. Again, it's a question, where is the product, what's available? Um, and there was just not so many portfolios in the market last year. And uh, we've also seen a stunning number of major deals, uh, most of all in the office segment. Um, among them, the largest single deal um, ever closed in the office market, that was the purchase of the development T1 for by Allianz in Frankfurt. 
Um, so that was a forward deal, 1.4 billion euros. That asset was. Next slide, please. Um, what's in focus? Yeah, well, there's lots of talk about uh, working from home. Where will we work in the future? Does the office have a future? Um, offers, the office segment is clearly dominating the market with almost 48% uh, market share last year with a very strong result of almost a good 30 billion euros. Retail was sluggish even before COVID. Um, there is a strong divide between um, high street retail um, where there is um, very moderate market activity, um, demand is hesitant. Um, versus uh, strong interest in retail warehousing and any retail assets that are grocery anchored and um, cater for the daily needs. Logistics for sure is the big winner of the COVID pandemic. That's across Europe, I believe, strongest result ever. And uh, more and more investors are turning to sort of alternate assets like um, healthcare. That's also something um, that's on the radar now. Um, and hotel is probably also making a good comeback um, in the next year. So next slide, please. Uh, who's investing? I'm not boring you to tears. Um, it's the special funds and the investment in asset managers. Um, but what I find striking is that 12% generated by project developers. Um, that shows clearly the strong interest and belief in the German market and the the ability and um, the commitment uh, to to deliver further product and believe in the strength of your, the occupier markets. Who's investing? Uh, same pictures last year. German uh, players clearly dominating the market with 61%. Um, foreign investors um, keep the level at 39%. It's not so bad as it sounds as um, they had seen the their highest share in 2015 with 50%, given the restrictions in uh, in traveling, that's a pretty good result. But we'll talk about it a little later, I think. Next slide, please. Um, COVID-19, the end, end of yield compression, certainly not. We have seen uh, prime net initial yields coming down uh, for most assets, um, exception for sure, shopping centers, there is um, some hesitance in the market for a reason. Uh, we've seen strong um, yield compression in the logistics sector, record low with 3% now. Retail warehousing, um, very tight. Um, and the office market, prime net initial yield below 3%. So that's quite a story. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, that was all about commercial. We clearly make a distinction between commercial and residential. Um, the German residential market is like one of the hot topics, I think, in German uh, in European real estate right now. Um, you see, we've seen a record volume of more than 50 billion. Um, just make sure you keep in mind that uh, one deal alone generated 22 billion, that was um, the taking over um, from Vonovia by Deutsche Wohn. That result is likely to stay for history because um, such um, acquisitions are not on the agenda every year. Um, next slide, please. And there's strong interest now in um, buildings that are certified, sustainable buildings. Uh, we've just released our investment sustainability report yesterday. The market share is now 25% uh, in single deals, um, and the trend is clearly showing upwards. Next slide. All right. Um, the underlying occupier markets, I think we'll talk about, next slide, please, about that a little later. What we see is there is um, a return of take up in the office markets. Logistics for sure is up. It's just a question of where is the supply in logistics. Um, in retail, we see more leasing activity than in the previous year, more shop openings. There's chances that um, retailers are actually taking. Hotel um, has been up. Um, 
the German residential market is a story of its own. And there's, as I said, more focus on healthcare now because we're such an aging population. I think we're the second oldest population in Japan. There's something that we need to do about that. Um, next slide. So I hope uh, I get this right, the hot topics, but we'll discuss this with the panel. Next slide, please. Is for sure the future of work. Where do we work? What will be the impact of um, working from home, mobility work on the office markets? Then for sure the German residential markets, very stable, very strong growth, rental wise, very low vacancy rates. Uh, alternative assets will be in focus for many, many investors. Then ESG, how do we get the S into the ESG? That's the next challenge. Uh, what was going to come up with inflation? Big question mark here and the, econ uh, the economic recovery for sure. Uh, will it come? Um, how will it accelerate? And if we are unlucky, next slide, we'll have further discussions on the latest um, well, discussion around the Ukraine. Well, thank you very much. I hope I made it in like 10 minutes. <laughs> Great, perfect. Um, thanks very much, Inga. Um, yes, a, a thorough, a, a thorough rush through the through the session there. That's that's brilliant. A really great introduction. Um, we've got a super panel here, um, so let's let's just start with with some brief introductions. Uh, maybe maybe let's start with you, Marcus. Um, just a brief introduction of yourself and the company, and then we'll move around everybody else. Marcus. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm representing Berlin Hip. Uh, we claim to be the most modern real estate financing house in uh, Germany. Um, focusing on real estate financing only, it's a typical German country bank. Um, I am heading a team of uh, originators, which takes care of about these 39% you mentioned, international money coming into Germany. And uh, when they buy and seek loans, then uh, they're here with us. And then also we take care of um, those cross-border investors who do uh, invest in markets where we are present as well. Great, and great to get the financing perspective on this as well. Um, uh, Christina, let's let's come to you. Brief introduction of yourself and, and AEW. Sure, perfect. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. I'm Christina Ofshanka. I'm uh, representing AEW this uh, morning. We're one of the well largest uh, globally investing asset and investment managers with more than 70 billion assets under management uh, globally. Me personally, I'm based in Frankfurt. I'm covering Europe and I'm responsible um, for overseeing our pan-European uh, core funds. Very happy to, to be here today and discussing the hot topics that uh, Inga just presented. Great, thanks, Christina. Um, Thomas, over to you, brief introduction of yourself and, and, and the role there at PwC. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Good morning. Um, I'm the person with the worst Wi-Fi connection today, so, so sorry about that. So I'm Thomas, I'm representing PwC real estate um, advisor in, in, in the German market. I'm personally a deals person um, and with our team of 500 people in, in Germany, we are doing all consulting services, tax services, assur assurance and audit services in the real estate or for the real estate industry. And of course, I'm also sponsoring our ESG and digital initiatives we are currently driving. Great, thanks, Thomas. Um, Reiner, over to you. Just uh, uh, an introduction of yourself and uh, an icy campus there. Thanks, Richard. Good morning, everyone. My name is Reiner. I'm presenting um, International Campus Group this morning. We are a provider of urban living solutions, which means student accommodation and young professional living. Um, geographical focus is continental Europe, especially Germany, Austria, Netherlands. We currently operate uh, more than four and a half thousand beds with a strong growth focus. And uh, we are about to expand our um, range to 10,000 beds within the next uh, two years. Great. Thanks, Rana. Um, Carsten, over, over to you. Good morning, everybody. Voice. Thomas has the worst uh, connection. I have the worst voice. And it's uh, neither, neither COVID nor drinking. It's just bad. Uh, happened this morning, so I can't really tell why, but you have to, you have to listen to me now. Um, my name is Garth Law, real estate partner at Linklit as one of the global law firms. And I was lucky to advise on the, one, some of the transactions that you just mentioned before, the big ones that drove the market last year. So I'm happy to share some insights as far as I can. Perfect. Thanks. And Inga, you you zoomed you zoomed through the presentation and didn't introduce yourself at the beginning. So let's do that now. Quick introduction okay. of yourself. 
Yeah, um, hi everybody, I'm Inga. I'm heading the uh, research department of BNP Paribas Real Estate in Germany. Uh, we are uh, we belong to BNP Paribas, uh, our brokerage firm. I think most people know us in the market. We are market leaders in many segments, most of all investment wise. So, um, so yeah. But we what we offer for sure is the entire um, services around the life cycle of a of an asset. Great, thanks very much. Um, and just a reminder to everybody that um, thanks a for joining us in the in the <laughs> Relax Auditorium. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, um, you'll be able to make comments, put questions in the Q and A. Um, the slides there that uh, that Inga produced in terms of the presentation are already there for you to download. Um, so feel free to download those. All of those buttons are available on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and the joy of it being live is that we can answer your questions, your comments, pick those up as part of the discussion. Um, let's let's just start, first of all, I guess, with that with that macro picture. Um, Thomas, maybe coming to you first, um, I, I suppose, how do you see that um, in, you know, in, in terms of um, the macroeconomic factors influencing, I suppose, a lot of the time wider European, but particularly the, the German markets. Yeah, I think it's it's more or less the same view for Germany and for Europe, um, starting with, with capital and interest into real estate and real assets. I think we what we see from all investors, the capital is growing um, because the alternative investment opportunities are not there yet, even in a uh, rising interest environment, we still see that the gap to the yield gap to real estate or real assets is uh, is significant and so <clears throat> the sector allocation is still growing um, but within the sector of course there's a lot of answer or a lot a bit of uncertainty about what type of assets can i buy is there enough um, uh, core assets available especially from the institutional player so that's what we see that there's a bit of uncertainty and in the past we've always seen if there's uncertainty there's a flight to quality quality countries stable countries such as germany but also more to the core core locations so that's a trend we currently see for capital I'm happy to discuss um, and of course we have the big big topic on esg where everyone is facing and um, being part of this journey for the next years, um, but it gives also orientation. It's a good thing, but it's still something which is which is developing. It's not there yet, and we exactly all know what we have to do. It's a journey, as I said. So these are the I would say it's general positive trends with the uncertainties around office use, as discussed, uh, the, the the new living um, themes we see in the markets, um, but still I would say overall a very positive environment that we are in. Okay, good. Um, and Marcus, it'd be interesting to get your your perspective on that, um, but also maybe pick up on some of the some of the challenges that there are in the market. I mean, Inga mentioned obviously in the presentation there, inflation, um, as well as Ukraine. And obviously there's been a huge amount of focus on political risk and what may be happening there. Um, we don't quite know yet what's going to happen in terms of uh, COVID. We assume that that hopefully this is it's beginning to blow its way out. Um, but I suppose what, what's your overall sense of that, and also some of those sort of key risks that I guess you're having to look at, Marcus, in in terms of that financing side as well. Yeah, what happens in Ukraine or whatever, nobody can can see. But uh, let's focus on those topics which are on the screen at the moment. So ESG was mentioned already. That is a big sector. Um, the entire stock is is not uh, according to what what needs to be done. So there's a big transformation going on. At, uh, we analyze every transaction coming in about the potential to to convert it into into green, into into conformity, and uh, there is a big big uh, uh, sector to be done. And the inflation you you mentioned, we see that at the moment, or suffer that when. Uh, Interest rate rise and and uh, some deals are committed already. The positive leverage effect will vanish, and that uh, makes some of the investors saying that we go all equity, we don't need any debt any longer because it doesn't doesn't pay out. So we have lost two or three transactions already because of that. So facing into um, when the deals are committed, that makes a knock on effect later on when you see when these you focus on your returns. That, that might have pressure on price, which we all expect. If inflation is there, then uh, the price will be under 
pressure. Even so, there's a, still a high demand in, in Germany. So there's a bit of, of demand, inflation, and ESG uh, topics, which really we need to focus on, and which um, are more in the, in the, in the picture than, than ever before. Okay, great. Um, I, I was I was just about to put into the chat. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, do please put questions in, and yeah. you're already putting questions in. So thanks very much for that, and I'll I'll definitely pick those up. Um, Christina, I just wanted to come to you from a uh, from an investor's perspective. Um, we'll drill down a little bit more into some of those key trends, but I suppose what's your perspective on that, and also particularly the the risk side? What have you been seeing? Well, I think one of most of the themes have already been been mentioned both by by, by Thomas and, and Marcus. We do see a flight to to quality, and I'm sure we'll we'll discuss that ESG, of course, and it needs to go beyond like the certifications. You really need to work with your assets and, and put up plans to to really change um, what uh, well all the all the all the criteria that that we have there. We see the inflation um, that is that is kicking in, but uh, very much as, as as Marcus was explaining. Um, we see most of the impact on the, let's say, high leverage um, buyers in, in this respect. And then um, again, I mean, new asset classes, new sectors that, that are emerging, as we've seen also from, from Inga's intro presentation, where you've seen healthcare, for instance, um, with, a, with a label in the, in the slide, which maybe two years ago wouldn't have been the case. So these are broadly, well, very much in line with, with what, we've, what we've heard already today. Yeah, that's interesting, actually. Um, and uh, Cathy, thanks for your question in the uh, in the chat there. Um, and just picking up that point around life life sciences, which is um, where do we see the healthcare and life sciences um, take up occurring within the real estate state space? Is this going to be a potential overtake in terms of the office space take up as a result of investment in health and science? Um, and where do we see this trend going in Germany? So I don't know whether anybody wants to wants to pick that up, Inga, whether you've got any more sort of views in terms of that healthcare side. Obviously, just interestingly, from from our perspective, we've maybe done one um, one focus on healthcare in amongst sort of mm -hmm. senior living, um, let's say 18 months ago. Um, and already this year, we've done a couple on on healthcare, and one drilling down even as far as precision medicine, for example. So it's just quite interesting to see how that's how that's moving. But what's what's the position there in in Germany, Inga? Well, it's it's a big market, and it's gonna 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 grow because we are such an aging uh, population. Um, there's lots of change also in the way we looking at seniors and um, how we um you know um make them you know ha have a good life uh, aging you know like what concepts do we use do we take care of them at home or do we um need to give them you know uh, a home outside of the family or will it be combinations so there is great demand for um independent life but with support from outside uh, so that'll be changed. Um, the other thing is that it's difficult to put up a homogeneous concept across Germany, the federal states, because there's different demands of how do you mm. what what are the the minimum requirements to to build a senior home? Uh, so that's a challenge. Um, there's lots going on. Um, there's lots of interest because it's such a growing market. Also, the shortage of labor is a big issue. Uh, there's a lot of things coming into play and it really needs determination and a very detailed focus on that segment. But for sure, there's there's great chances and potential. Uh, there is no doubt about it. So so this is um, what we see in terms of like senior housing and all that. Um, life sciences is coming, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we have more and more uh, questions on that, but we haven't digged into that um, topic really in terms of research yet. I have to admit, but um, for sure, it's it's a, it, it's it's big. It's coming. I mean, there's so many things going on. Jeremy just underlined that it's a great place for uh, research and development, right? I mean, no, great. Thanks, Thanks. Um there's another question in there as well, which is around um, the sort of brown discount, and, and we'll pick that up. I'm, I'm going to come to ESG in a minute, um, but I just wanted to to pick up, um, Carsten, maybe maybe coming to you on this. Um, 
it would be interesting to get the perspective, particularly from Germany on the new government, whether there's any particular changes there, any change of emphasis, um, anything that's useful to know for, um, I suppose, people who are, who are looking to invest in Germany from, from outside, potentially. <laughs> you like to ask me that question. Um, no, yes, I mean, the government. Um, I think we we uh, were lucky to find a... Uh, uh, a new stable government, and that wasn't that wasn't absolutely sure before. So I think the outcome is is a good one and almost a wise one, basically, because it brings um, different groups um, together. And I think the, uh, the they had a good start. Yes, people might complain that um, Scholz is a bit silent, but okay, let's let's he, he has always been like this, so it's a bit Nordish. So so let's give it some time. I, I think they had a good start. And what I also like to see is there's the strong opposition now by CDU. Um, so um, I think the, the, the shape of it is, 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 is good. Um, uh, and they look into, if you, if you read it, basically, they look into things which, which worried people over time, um, such as aging, or education, whatsoever. So, so they looked into more details or, or simple things like how can the family in Germany choose their names? So I, when I studied that in the back in the nineties, I didn't really get it, and it was changed since then. And basically, to kind of have the idea that people might have the yeah you know, the brains to choose their name properly um, is something which is which which kind of creates hope for the future. So I think we are we are on very good terms there. Um, brings the society back together. So, so I'm, I'm very positive, and I think that's that's the message to the world as well. There's neither right nor left wing. It is a centered government which takes the economy serious. Um, and yes, I think the, the 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 next thing is both based basically it's not the German government, but all of them is really take the E and the S serious. Um, the, the because there is a real need and we all see the real problems. And I think foreign politics is something that the European countries need to take more serious. You, Ukraine was just, a, I mean, was, was just an, it's just an example, but we are basically uh, not in a position to defend ourselves anymore. And not, none of the European countries is. Um, and that's nothing um, that can stay forever like this. So I think there, there must be an opening. Um, and the, Germany as a whole needs to kind of understand that they are a strong force in Europe, that they need to cooperate with the others, but that they need to do something and they can't just sit back and wait for the Americans to solve the issues that might arise on an international level. Okay, good. Um, Rainer, I wanted to pick up with you um, just the, the situation in terms of um, the KFW, for example, because that's that's something that I wasn't following closely in, in, in London, um, but I know that that's, that's an issue that, that you've experienced. So um, it'd be interesting to get your perspective on that and, and also potentially what that means for your business. Yeah, thanks for that question, Richard. Uh, for those who are not that familiar with it, KFW state-owned bank runs several programs uh, to support resi development with an energetic focus. Uh, those programs have been in place for various years. They provide uh, interest benefits and uh, subsidies, depending on which program type you choose. Um, end of last year, I think it was already foreseeable that funding for 22 will cut short or will be tighter. But then uh, uh, mid-Jan, the government stopped the programs at all. Uh, now slightly, they have taken a step back and have reopened the KFW 40 pretty uh, in, in the last years uh, to make themselves eligible to uh, this specific type of funding. And a lot of uh, the developments we have seen in the last years as regards the potential developer profit were pretty much depending on these programs and subsidies to be drawn from these. And uh, this has an impact on uh, the number of new developments uh, in the resi sector, especially in the uh, micro and student sector, where the fact that uh, the, the smaller the units are, uh, the higher the impact on the overall um, development fin financing is. 
And if you look into the market, uh, I think the, the, the figures have just been published last year. The sector had uh, 1.3 million billion, sorry, of transaction volume, which was uh, double the volume of uh, the COVID hit year 2020. And uh, we might see a dip at least in the in the first half of this year because um, the, uh, the transactions are pretty much depending on new developments as stock to be traded is pretty limited. And uh, overall, I doubt whether it will help uh, to achieve the government their own set targets of uh, uh, bringing 400,000 resi units to the market in addition every year. And secondly, I think the longer the pause now will be, because government has introduced that the, the renewed program will more focus on uh, uh, carbon output than on uh, primary energy consumption. I personally expect this uh, to take at least until the end of this year, until operational and eligible programs uh, will be put in place to succeed the old ones. Um, so does that mean, Rainer, that there'll be a pause from some developers in terms of um, their their planning until they could get more clarity on that? Or what's the situation? Well, uh, spontaneously, we've seen some, some deals falling apart because they were no longer eligible to the subsidies. And uh, construction costs are what they are. Uh, I don't expect uh, all developers to uh, shift from their current 10-15% developer margins to a pro bono uh, setup, so uh, potentially we will see pressure on land prices. Okay, good, interesting. Thanks, Rainer. Um, uh, Christina, it would be interesting to get from your perspective um, what we're seeing in terms of capital flows. Um, I mean, Interesting that we, you know, with interest rate rises, we may then see bond yields going up um, and, and potentially, therefore, a move away from real estate back into bonds. Do you see that or are you still seeing a sort of overwhelming weight of capital looking at looking at, at, at Germany, let's say, and real estate in general? Well, we see both, I would say. Of course, uh, interest rates, well, based on, on inflation development, is, uh, is followed very closely by managers, by investors, uh, uh, and all the all participants of, of the market. But then we do see a lot of capital still being interested in, in real estate in general. When we see when we talk about capital flows, I mean we've we've seen the the, the pie chart that that Inga has has shown with the, if I recall correctly, like more than sixty percent domestic uh, investments, uh, German money in the German market. I think looking forward, we would see this um, to, to change a little bit. So more uh, well, non-domestic money coming to, to other markets with Germany having a bit of a particular uh, positioning in there where there's a strong confidence of local market participants for their own market. It's backed by, by solid fundamentals. So we do expect also, um, let's say, foreign capital coming to the markets. But then based on the, on the macroeconomic development, you need to to look at the origin of um, of such capital, if you take U.S. Or, or Asian capital, for instance, they traditionally come with a with a requirement of really high total returns, which in this particular um, environment might not be so easy to to achieve. So that's the overall the overall sentiment where we're seeing. Okay, good. And, and Marcus, from from your perspective, what are you seeing in terms of the the capital flows there? Um, are you seeing a sort of yeah. increased um, interest again from from international capital into the German market? Well, it has always been a strong strong demand from international money that goes all through throughout. And uh, I mean, Inga showed it in the beginning. No? It was a hype in uh, with over fifty percent in two thousand fifteen or sixteen there. Um, and it's a, it's a, it is a constant flow into that. That's why our team is, is set up in a way to, to really serve those needs. Um, uh, yeah, once in a while there is a lot of core money going in, um, but also there's money, as, as uh, Christina just said, looking for higher returns. And then you need to find the right product, uh, the right uh, choice of, of, of risk for that money. And uh, with, a, with a positive leverage that, that might even play out. So the, the, these are the ones which most likely take higher 
higher leverages to, to get to the returns. Uh, but we see in the overall uh, development in the past years was a trend towards less leverage because there's so much equity in the market. Um, so the overall risk in the banks has decreased over, over the last years uh, in terms of leverage. Okay, great. Interesting. Good, good to know but, that. Um, I think what you, Richard, what you have to see is like if you look at the, the, the biggest uh, fundraisers or the biggest kind of investors in terms of where they do come from, this is what, what drove the market, I think, in COVID. Because they come, and obviously the US, and then, then Germany is almost second, and then France. So, and they couldn't move, they couldn't do anything. So, they invested where they come from. So, this is what we saw clearly in COVID times that they, in Germany, the big, large open ended funds. Uh, and that drove the market in, and I've different from, from the UK mainly, where, where, the, where London attracts kind of international capital and they couldn't do anything. That's probably the main difference, not because the market in London was weaker, but they just couldn't get there. Okay, good. Um, it'd be interesting to pick up. I mean, one of the key trends everybody's talked a little bit about there is is ESG, and that's been a growing focus in you know over the last you know twelve eighteen months in all of the sessions that we've done. Um, Thomas, may, maybe just starting with you, there, there was a question in terms of. Um, I suppose the stranded assets, the brown discount side. Um, what's what's your sense of that, particularly in 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 the German market? I guess you know the scale of the potential problem there, um, and and I suppose the the transition of those is going to be absolutely key. Yeah, um, I think that's a good that's a good question. Um, as I said, ESG is a longer journey, and we just end of last year we published this this handbook in ESG, six hundred pages. And was completely sold hours after one week. It shows me uh, that that there is a high interest. And if you look globally at ESG, the EU and within the EU, I would say even Germany is is um, is is driving is driving the ESG agenda. And um, yes, there is a sentiment about um, what is the with the valuers also end of last year as we see it on the audit side. Is there do we have to discount assets back which are not green? We are not there yet to to be able to quantify if it's 25 basis points or if it's 50 50 basis points for an ESG compliant building. But clearly, talking about the institutional markets um, uh, or institutional investors. There is a stronger focus, and we have seen that in Inga's charts. That, uh, if I remember right, 25% of the of the assets were certified um, building. So there is a clear <clears throat> trend that the fund managers who wants to upgrade their existing, and especially new funds, to Article 8 or Article 9, so regulated green, light green or dark green funds, that's clearly they are more focusing on assets that have um, a certificate, which is still the common sense that the certificate is is something that shows me that the building is green. If that's right or not, something we can discuss for hours now, because it's a pretty limited scope. It doesn't cover all the ESG points, especially on, on the asset and T side, but it's a starting point. So that's, and um, my, my, my personal sentiment is that, that investors are willing to pay a bit more if, if it's a green building. But as already discussed, the problem with ESG is not the new buildings that are traded by institutional investors and often also financed by the banks like Berlin Hoop. I think that the, the problem sits with the existing stock, owned not by the institutional investors, um, like the, the most after the Second World War, most of the residential <coughs> buildings in Germany were constructed in the 50s and 60s. And there, that's where the problem, where the, where the issues and the transformation has to focus on and where also where I personally also see the opportunity. So, you, you always have to see, are you discussing with institutional investors where the, the issue is coming from the regulator and from the, from the investors asking for green products, green funds? Or if you talk to private owners owning, I don't know, 10 residential units somewhere, they're not moving um, as fast as institutional world, I would say. Okay, good. Um, and, and Marcus, just from your perspective, looking at the, at the German market, how supportive are the banks going to need to be? Um, 
is there a is there a danger of these drowned assets? Will they get financing in terms of turnaround strategies? Are there some assets that I suppose will just need a different solution? What, what's your sense of that? Well, there, there, there is now it's finally in the in the in the center of attention. Now we we started it back in two thousand fifteen with the, with the green bond program. We, we separated. There was no market for that. There was no benchmarking. So we created our own benchmark, saying which assets qualify. Um, as green, and then we issued a green uh, fund brief against that. Just as a as a matter of foreseeing what is what is coming. Finally, now I mean we have something which is the use is publishing have a clear statement where where everybody can uh, measure it against, and uh, there are not that many properties which comply actually, and that will have a run on those properties, and then you, you see them. The discount or the premiums you have to pay that will develop now in in, in the coming years. Mm -hmm. So what we do, um, we look at those buildings. We try to co convert our green bonds into taxonomy conform uh, uh, financing, um, making sure that the uh, loans are complying. Then we can even issue uh, certificates uh, that you have a green financing um, if that is that is required. Um, but the challenge is really to. And with the KFW programs falling away or, or being renewed at the moment, how to convert and how to transform um, properties. And there we do, we create new products like a transformation loan or something there where we really sit out a period of, of redevelopment of, of basically emptying buildings, reconstruct or put them into compliance with uh, with uh, all the, uh, the measurements which are needed to be taken and uh, then convert them into into something uh, compliant yeah so th there are programs and loans being created now particularly for these situations so we are on that as a as a bank and i think others as well okay great thanks um christina it'd be interesting to get your perspective from the investment side um and then we'll drill down a little bit in terms of some of the sectors um but but it'd be good to get your perspective on that um as an investor um i mean do you see the the, the sort of greening of portfolios more on the resilience side do you expect to see a, a return on investment from that um what's your sense of that mm -hmm. Well, I think, I mean, this is really like one of the key key topics we are, we're discussing and we're, we're working on today. And I, and I agree with, with many of the, of the statements that I've, that I've just heard from, from the fellow panelists. I think if we look at the commercial sides so and not looking at the, at the privately owned resi, as, as Thomas pointed out, but really commercially owned and also commercially operated um, and occupied assets. I think one point we definitely and owners have to take into account is the occupation. It's, it's just a different question than talking about green premium or brown discount. It's really um, what are our occupiers going to do? And mainly we see, and this is increasing even, it's not a question of, of pricing if your building is not complying with, well, latest energy uh, standards or efficiency. Uh, needs, etc. It's rather a black or white um, decision whether they actually sign a lease or don't. So it's a it's a pure requirement for for owners to to think about um, making their their assets compliant with with modern energy standards to secure occupation and to secure um, their income stream. And that's a much more fundamental question than discussing whether there's a discount or or a premium to it. That's maybe the the, the one comment from from this side and. And uh, looking at the at the banking and, and loan side, I think it's it's really great um, initiatives that the Berlin Hip are, are doing, and we, we see this um, from 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 other participants as, as well. And it and it covers um, many um, many sectors, many types of use. So we're we've just obtained um, a, a green loan for for logistics um, building, and it's it's always difficult to to measure how you fall into that bucket and, and how not. Of course, a certificate is, is always helpful. And then it's really referencing on the energy output of a, of a building. And if it's uh, better than, uh, than the reference group, then you, then you classify it. And I think it's, it's a constant effort that, um, that needs, to be, needs to be done. And you really have to get to the, to the bottom of, of, of the features of, of every asset and, and then of every, every portfolio to constantly do the work and, and improve um, the assets from this respect. Yeah, no, that's Richard, one, one additional comment on the on the specific question, green premium or brown discount. I would say from a, but that's a personal feeling, I would say we are currently in a market situation where we see green premiums more 
um, as, as and less brown discounts. But if we are moving down the road on ESG for the next years, I think we, that will shift to a brown discount if refinancing of specific assets is just not possible. I haven't seen that in real estate yet. I've seen that in other um, in other sectors where we did a corporate restructuring as PwC and there was a coal piece in this corporate structure which was not refinanceable in the European market. So the, the company had to carve that out to have the opportunity to refinance the rest of the business and the brown, the, the, the coal related piece had to be fully equity refinanced. So that's the situation I haven't seen in real estate yet. But if we are there and it will come, I'm sure it will take, I don't know, potentially one, two, three years, then we will talk about stranded assets and bond discounts, definitely. Okay, interesting. Um, let, let's let's drill down a little bit into some of the some of the sectors as well. Um, Rainer, let, let's let's start with you in terms of obviously residential has been a huge focus. Um, but but what's the position at the moment in terms of, of particularly your sector there, looking at that micro living and student housing side? Various aspects. Uh, firstly, um, we have seen after let's say. A visible dip in 2020 in that occupancies in the sector have revived. Um, the sector in Germany, which includes us, is occupancy-wise north of uh, 90%. Um, we have seen, as mentioned earlier, transactions doubling compared to 20. So the sector has proven resilience and uh, we see a lot of investors' appetite uh, to give you a little bit of uh, comparison, uh, the sector in Germany values around 6 billion euro, which is 10% of the UK market. And uh, the UK market uh, has been driven over decades from Anglo-Saxon investors who are with an increasing trend looking into continental Europe. And looking into continental Europe means looking into Germany. Uh, for sure. And uh, we know about at least six, seven billion who are targeting continental Europe, which is already exceeding the, the sector value in Germany, uh, which makes us believe that we will see, despite some setbacks coming from uh, development financing, as mentioned earlier uh, on this panel, uh, there will be a very strong demand for PBSA for micro solution for urban uh, accommodation products uh, from an international perspective. And uh, the effects will be rising prices, further pressure um, on yields. So we are extremely positive for the sector for 22. Okay, great. Good. Um, there was a question um, actually came in as well. Um, uh, it would be interesting to get your view on that on on German retail. Um, so, is the market shifting post COVID nineteen? Um, are retail offers owning more flexible contracts? Um, so, I suppose it would, are you seeing a more positive outcome for for retail potentially going forward? And what's what's the sort of overall view there? Well, what I said before, there is a clear distinction between retail warehousing and anything supermarket discounter wise anything that's anchored to groceries and daily needs and caterings that is uh, very stable there we have seen growth there is a strong demand from investors there's a lack of product that's what's driving the market when you look into uh, the high streets and the shopping centers a different story for sure um, we have seen uh, closings on the high streets, um, but there's movement, right? It's not that you see uh, like vacancy next to vacancy, vacant space. In terms of retailers entering now the high streets, we see a lot of mobility concepts, e-mobility. That includes cars, uh, that includes bikes. There's a lot of bike shops now in Hamburg, um, high-end bike shops. And there's a lot of retailers who think, okay, this is an opportunity. I have now the possibility to rent a very good spot uh, at a lower price level, and I'm taking the risk. Um, and then, for sure, um, there is a number of rising concepts in, in, in gastronomy. We see a lot of movement. movement. And don't forget, shopping centers are also coming back. We've seen two transactions in, in Berlin now. 
Boulevard Berlin was traded, and the other is not such a, a classic shopping center, but Galerie Lafayette. So investors show an interest, and there's belief people returning to the high streets and returning to shopping centers. I mean, I would have, if you'd asked me in 2019, would a German go shopping with a mask on? I would have said, no way, but we do. We love that. It's social. We are social people. So there's, for sure, there's transformation. We've seen that before in retail. So COVID is just an acceleration of how retail changes and our CBDs change. But um, there is chances, there's uh, opportunities, and it's going to be exciting to see in the next couple of years. Um, yeah. I'm about it. May I, may I, the two examples you just mentioned, uh, yes, they are retail schemes, but they will be scaled down to to a basic one and then convert it to other use. You know, that, that they will be repositioned in a, in a way that the retail will diminish and they, they will have more office uh, use. In, in I, think, I think retail will persist. The question is how we mix it with other uses. How do we attract people and, and shopping? And uh, maybe it's a return also with the combination of cinemas. I mean, we had that before in Germany. I'm so old, I remember all that, right? And it would work. Like, a, a German wouldn't go shopping and then go to the movies, but maybe this has changed, right? So, um, and I, I think there's a lot of change in the inner cities. And um, and there's, we're going to see more movement in the retail investment market than before. And that's apart from retail warehousing. We're going to see more movement. I'm very sure about that. And that's a great story, I would say, for high street. If you look at the German high streets, it's in the last 10, 20 years, it was really boring because they were all looking the same. And the transformation there, the assets are all 40, 50 years or the warehouse structures. I think it's a good momentum. If you look globally, there are good examples where we can see how how we can change it. And I think it, there's also a lot of good news. It's a good storyline to bring life back into the inner cities. I think the general trend, we had a big discussion around, is urbanization stopped by COVID? I think there is a currently for all, for office use, for retail, there is a sentiment in general, the urbanization trend is not stopped. People want to live in cities, in large cities. And that also pays in, in high street, in office uses. Uh, that's why I'm in general positive, but it will be a transformational process for sure. But it also has a lot of good news. Okay, great. Um, we've only got around five minutes, five minutes left. So, um, but one thing I did want to pick up that was interesting, I thought, Inger, in, in, the, in the presentation was um, the strength of the Berlin market. I know over previous years when we've been covering Germany and I've mentioned, you know, will Berlin at some day be on a par with London or Paris? Everybody said no. What, what's anybody's views on that? Well, I because you must Marcus, have a view from Berlin here. So. Yeah, Mark, but he is probably the most critical about it because he's from Berlin. But um, just on a side note, uh, I've been waiting, and many of us, for Berlin to come out of the woodworks and uh, acclaim this capital status for how many years was it? More than 20, right? And we waited and waited and waited. It was just the last couple, of, like five years or something, that all of a sudden is, is on this international stage and there's interest from everybody and the occupier markets are so strong that Marcus, the floor is yours. No, I can confirm that yeah, I've been with Berlin for 10 years now and the ever since it became the investment El Dorado, which we thought it would happen after reunification. Uh, it was this this 20 year gap that really the government moved, the, uh, the lobbyists moved and, and whatever. So, and now the international attraction is, is there. Um, being also based on a, on a big stock of, of resi for rent uh, uh, market, which doesn't exist in, in, in Paris or in London in that, in that uh, scale. Um, so that's where a lot of trade is, but there's also is where the danger is when the entire parts of the city are becoming so expensive that nobody can afford to live there any longer and then the people are, have to move out. So it is a trend which is in the political arena and is very well observed. Um, but Nevertheless, Germany is a federal state, and you see it in Munich and Frankfurt and Stuttgart and to that extent. So that is the difference between Germany and, and, and any other country. So, yeah, Berlin is keeping up, but it will never be a, a, a big market as, as Paris uh, and, and London uh, is per se not, not the case. But interesting okay. anyway. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice <laughs> development. And it's, it's great to be here uh, and to see that, uh, that dynamic in the market and this internationality as well. It's good for Germany. <laughs> 
Great. We've got a couple of minutes left. So I just wanted to get from everybody their kind of views, I suppose, on um, what they're seeing in terms of the, the key opportunities going forward in the in the German market. Um, so maybe let's 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 start with you, Thomas, in, in terms of the opportunities. Um, what do you see as the key opportunity? Yeah, well, no big surprise, I would say, um, transformation of assets in good urban centers. So buying all the assets transform, I think that's the biggest opportunity we have. And uh, the stock is big enough for everyone. <laughs> okay, great. Rainer, what's, what's, your, what's your view? Well, I think if you focus on, on resi and the resi hybrids, be it student or micro or senior living, uh, you can't do a lot wrong perspectively for the mid to long term um a lot of a lot of movement in the uh and progress in the alternative sector but i strongly believe that not only from an esg side the the core multifamily stock will see some uh, need for repositioning and for renewing the uh, next five to ten years and this provides a lot of opportunities for developers Core plus investors and uh, others that might uh... not the opportunities, but maybe have a close look at inflation and the indexation clauses, because actually proper properly drafted indexation clauses can hedge inflation, but in re reverse they can make things worse. So so if you look at hurdles and stuff like that, agreed in the retail sector. So have a closer look. This wasn't on the agenda for 15 years, so there's generations out there who have never seen that before, um, and that is. That is a real issue. It's an opportunity at the same time. Okay, great. Thanks, Inga. The beauty of Germany is, is, is this big economic powerhouse, and we have strong demographics and very promising long-term trends, I believe. Um, and we have a lot of change in all the segments. There's a lot of transformation going on. So uh, depending on your investment focus, for sure, you will find great opportunities um, in any segments across the entire country, you just have to watch closely and uh, be diligent in, in your purchase and uh, decision making. But I think it's a great place to invest. Great, thanks. Um, Marcus, over to you. What, what, what are you seeing? No, no I, I agree with uh, the speakers here. Um, and as, as I said before, we, we are preparing a new product uh, for this transformation, as a transformation loans, um, how to structure those, how to build the covenants right to, to really allow for this transition and to make that compliant. Yeah. So that is the, one of our main uh, focuses in the going forward. Great, thanks very much. And uh, last but very much not least, you know, well, I would say let's follow the, the, the broad socioeconomic mega trends that mirror the transformation we, we've been discussing. So really look into every single sector. Why is demand by, by an asset and why is an asset ready for the future? Or how can you manage it to be ready for the future, depending on the, on the nature of your, of your capital? And Great, really interesting. Um, thanks very much for, for all of your views. Um, thank you as well for, for the questions. Um, we'll try and answer any of those as well by, uh, by text if we haven't answered them all, um, already. Thank you, everybody.